back with another episode of the Refu podcast. We've got a, a fun guest today, Steve Travaglini. I don't think I butchered your last name. I practiced a lot, so it's good. Uh, <laughs> CRO over at Link Squares, and excited to have you on. No, thank you, Darren. Ryan, it's good to be here. Yeah, good to see you, that, Darren. That's why I had you do the intro. I didn't practice as much as you. It's all good. <laughs> all good. Uh, yeah, Steve. I knew a few months ago after seeing some of your posts on LinkedIn that you'd you'd ultimately hopefully be a good customer of ours, just with how transparent you are with sales hiring and your sales org. Um, and then thinking about the podcast, it's like you'd be a great guest on the podcast. So, thanks for joining us. Absolutely, and we can check both of those boxes now. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's vision coming to light. Um, uh, I guess we'd love to have you start with just telling us, you know, your backstory and more about you so that, so our, our audience can get to know you a little better. Yeah, for sure. So my name is Steve. I'm the CRO at Link Squares. I run uh, sales, customer success, rev ops, uh, enablement, all that good stuff. Uh, and uh, I've been in uh, SaaS and tech now for uh, close to eight years. And I started my career off in recruitment. Uh, um, so uh, I've, I've kind of come up through the ranks. I've done every job from uh, being a recruiter, uh, uh, sourcing talent, uh, being a BDR, account executive, manager, director, VP of sales, and now the CRO gig. So I've, I've seen a lot in a condensed window and I've, I've had a blast doing it. Awesome. And I think even going farther back, um, what, what I love about your backstory is the school of hard knocks and, and just, mm -hmm. just creating a work ethic and, and customer service probably came from landscaping and dishwasher and all those roles. Um, but I think some of that's important too, for people. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, uh, uh, like many people, you know, uh, when you're in high school, college, you have all these kind of odd jobs and things like that. That. But I actually advertise it on my LinkedIn uh, because I'm a huge fan of uh, of the non traditional candidate, and I want folks that maybe aren't as uh, qualified in a traditional sense to look at my page and see it as a more approachable, uh, 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 you know, type of company. And our top producer uh, in Q2, uh, only eight months on the job, uh, is a son of a lobster boat for fisherman who spent most of his days uh, pulling traps and things like that. So. Uh, I think there's a lot of parallels between uh, uh, the underlying underpinning uh, uh, work ethic of individuals and success in sales. Yeah, definitely. What about being an athlete? You play college football. How does, how does that, do you feel like that any of that carried over? Yeah, I, I, I think that there's a, a ton of that that carries over. And I think that it's unpopular today to say that you're looking for uh, college athletes and folks like that uh, because it does narrow the field. Uh, 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 but I totally disagree that college athletes as a, a, a background or underlying quality uh, isn't one that, that aligns with success in sales. I actually see it as having a high, high correlation, the commitment of balancing academics, uh, practice, workouts, all of that, uh, uh, and successfully completing four years uh, of collegiate athletics speaks to a massive amount of perseverance and, and, and underlying grit. Of course, you can find that in many different areas of life, and it's not exclusive to athletics. Uh, uh, but I, but I do love to see uh, uh, college athletes. I would, yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. I think when you know we used to think about it the same way. I used to think about it the same way. It's not about whether you were an athlete or not. It's about whether you were able to juggle a lot of priorities at the same time to accomplish a goal, right? Like whether it's an athlete or whether it's I got to pay my way through college, so I'm busting tables every night and weekend. It's the time commitment, right? Um, exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it was. And, yeah. And, it was, yeah. And Go there's ahead. lots of candidates that never even went to college, right? Right. So, so, so uh, uh, their story is independent, and you have to and you have to look at it for for what it is, right? But uh, uh, I totally agree with you. Yeah. T tell us about that. Um, how how did you break into it? So I think I'd, I'd love to hear about two transitions, like for your, your staffing background for a few years, you were in there, but that was, seems like transitioning from school hard knocks to a, a job like that, like a kind of a, call it a career, if you will, it's like a major transition. Uh, so maybe, maybe talk about that. And then we'll talk about getting out of that into tech sales because a lot, we hear it all the time. How do I get in tech sales? I'd love to hear just like those, for you, those transitions, and maybe we can kind of figure out how that can apply to the folks who are listening and trying to do the exact same thing that you did. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so uh, I came into the job market uh, right after, you know, the Great Recession. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, things were starting to turn. Um, and uh, it was still definitely a, um, 
a company uh, 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 leaning hiring market the, the companies had the power uh, there were a lot of people on you know out there looking for jobs i applied to a whole bunch of tech companies i uh, had absolutely no interest people were looking for entry level salespeople with 5 to 6 years of experience and uh, uh, it's still a riddle to me today when people are looking for that um but i was in that camp and uh, i was just trying to find any entry point that I could get into a sales role and a uh, family owned uh, staffing company based out of central Massachusetts near where I went to uh, college. I was hiring, they gave me a shot and uh, you know, I ran with it from there. And that was, that was in the staffing side. Uh, um, so that's where I learned uh, uh, still to this day, the hardest sell uh, or sale uh, uh, that I've ever had to pull off, which is, recruiting people, major life change, very emotional, uh, uh, and talking to countless folks, very similar to, to how you would think about uh, operating a top funnel uh, uh, in um, software, tech sales, except when you start to go through the funnel, your product's actually uh, uh, you know, saying no, right? So you find the perfect candidate after sending 25 candidates to this uh, hiring manager at this company, and they offer them the job, and then the candidate says, yeah, no, thank you. Or even worse, they show up uh, for the job, they accept the offer, and a week later, they they decide that this isn't for them, and then and then all of your commission, all of the placement fee, just goes right back to the house. So uh, uh, I I I I felt uh, uh, like uh, you know staffing was certainly elevation training uh, uh, for tech sales. Uh, by the time I got in uh, uh, to that space, uh, uh, it felt like hey, like this is pretty straightforward. <laughs> I have a I've got a new like term and, and kind of mindset when with stuff like that, like the clawbacks. I just go numb mentally. I just go numb to to numb it all out and just pretend like it never happened. It's the only way to survive. Oh yeah. And coming from staffing and, and you're thinking about software clawbacks on commissions, uh, it, it's every day in staffing. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, by the time I got to, uh, uh, tech, I, I didn't even think about it because it was just normal course of everyday life as a recruiter. T tell us about that, um, that transition into tech. How did that, how did that come about? It sounds like you were trying to get into tech originally. So you maybe always had your eye on it and were thinking about it. And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's something, there's something to be said for the, uh, velocity of careers in tech. Right. And that was something that I was observing. Uh, uh, I was at a phenomenal company. That staffing business is great. Uh, the Davis companies, the Davis family are phenomenal individuals. And, and, and they gave me so much of my baseline for sales. Uh, Patty Flaherty over there was my mentor. She was, she was great. Um, still is, uh, still close. Um, but I was seeing uh, uh, specifically in the Boston uh, uh, tech uh, uh, ecosystem, there were individuals that were just you know, getting these great opportunities uh, 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 earlier in their careers than what you would ever see in staffing. You know, on the on, on the staffing front, if you're a 30 year family owned business, uh, uh, incredibly profitable and, and successful in every way, uh, you have a lot of lieutenants who've been there for 15, 20 years. And in the tech scene, when you're going from a five person startup to a 20 person startup to a 50 person startup to a 100 person startup to 150 and 200, you know, post startup scale starts to occur. You see these people that just get like sucked up in the vacuum and have these phenomenal learning experiences uh, uh, well before they're prepared for it. And uh, I've always been a fairly intense, passionate uh, individual with an entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, and I was seeing things there in tech that I was envious of. So um, I reached out to some recruiters uh, uh, because I was a recruiter and, and uh, uh, recruiters often kind of have the keys to many of the kingdoms that you might not be able to get into. Uh, and they represent all different types of candidates. And I figured if I could win over a few recruiters, uh, they might be able to pitch me as a non-traditional like person that you should take a bet on. Um, so I got in with a few recruiters and they got me all around town and I just started doing interviews and, and one of them popped, uh, uh, and, uh, it was all history from there, I guess. It's a good, it's a good point. I want to call out what you said, which is, it also kind of goes to the importance of understanding as, as somebody who's interested in getting into tech or switching companies or looking for a great opportunity that you use the phrase kind of get sucked up in the vacuum. Right. And, and. That, that happens when a few things come together. Number one, like the company has a, an incredible product, right? Like for growth, right? And 
you know, if, if there's a dud of a product, right, that's just, even you could be an incredible sales person with incredible potential, that's not going to happen. So just, right. it, you know, picking, picking the right horse, so to speak, to, to get on is so valuable. It, it, two equal salespeople could have widely, drastically different careers based on, uh, based on that. And so, it's, so, you know, if, if you, it's just such an opportunity, if you can get on in that right one, you'll see people that are at these incredibly elevated positions not that it's not deserved, but at, at really young ages and with less experience. And um, so good, good call out there. Even at the same org, right? Like it could be a great SMB product market fit and enterprise doesn't have it. And the enter- you bring on these all-star uh, enterprise reps and their career flounders a little bit because the product's not ready yet, but these SMB reps are getting promoted. They get rolled up to VPs and they get, they go somewhere else. I mean, it's crazy. Just the segment too. Yeah. Yeah. I think you guys are hitting on a ton of great points. I agree with, um, I think you need to find the right company that has a, 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 a solid culture, uh, uh, not just in sales. A lot of people, you know, think about, uh, uh, sales kind of overfit for, for that sales team versus thinking about the bigger picture and what's happening in product and, you know, the velocity of the business and the founders and, uh, uh, the venture capital, if, it, if it's tech and, you know, who the investors are. And there's, you know, a lot that goes into making that decision. Um, I think one uh, uh, just as critical uh, uh, of a mistake that people make is overfitting on the product uh, uh, and thinking less about uh, uh, at times the sales leadership team. What, you know, what is that makeup? What is that mentality of that leadership group? How do they think about the world? How are you going to align with that leadership team? Because ultimately, that's how I made my selection. I picked uh, Backupify uh, uh, as my first tech company. Uh, Rob May was the CEO, uh, really successful business that was acquired by Datto. Picked the company because of Chris Essler, who is the VP of sales. Just something about him that just really resonated with me and, and Rob Flynn and Mark Eaton, uh, two of the directors at the time, just jumped off the page as people I could learn a ton from that I'd get along with that if I worked hard, uh, uh, you know, I think that I could, I could see myself working with those guys for a long time, which has all been true. Um, you have to pick people that you think are going to want to pull you up. Um, and if, you, if you're not getting that vibe in the interview process, even if it's a wonderful company, great company, I wouldn't take the opportunity. Yeah, and, and I, I'm, I'm, my, my next question is going to be, you know, you mentioned particularly on your LinkedIn, you've said it, you know, how incredible the team Backupify was and is yeah. and was, um, and, and was there more than just, hey, this is a great leader that I'm working for? Obviously, it was acquired, so there's something positive happening product-wise, product market fit-wise. Um, other, other clues that you had that like, hey, this, and, and you, frankly, you're only there before it was acquired couple little over two years so it was, must have been yeah. a, a very quick ascent um, yeah. a special special time yeah yeah there was there was definitely a lot of things that were happening uh, uh, at that point in time I think the real special thing was this uh, uh, grouping of individuals across multiple disciplines uh, that were all incredibly talented and, and when you walked in you just had the sense that there was just as much excitement uh, and just as much talent packed into every different department within the business. Uh, and that's really how I came to be uh, uh, the uh, head of sales originally, VP of sales at Link Squares before being promoted to CRO. I met the founders of Link Squares back in those backup of five days. Uh, Vishal, our CEO, was uh, running operations for the business. Chris Combs, one of our co-founders, was in sales and customer success. Um, Juliet Kapecki, our CMO at Link Squares, was, was running product marketing at the time. Um, Eric Alexander, our CTO, was one of the top engineers at, uh, in the building. Um, and there's just so many additional people, like my former uh, uh, manager, Rob Flynn, who's now over here at Link Squares, helping to run rap, uh, revenue strategy. Um, uh, Katie Thornton, who, who runs our uh, PR and comms, a director over in marketing, was at Packify. There's so many of us that just met, and we were at different earlier stages of our careers. I think we just earned the respect and credibility with each other that, you know, uh, this is what you do. You're great at it. This is what I do. I'm great at it. I think a lot of people don't think about um, 
the other folks in the business and just how much you, you can and will uh, overlap with them in the future uh, uh, if you really put your best foot forward and, and, and try and be a heck of a teammate uh, uh, and contributor to the business's success, those folks are going to be the CEOs uh, and C-suite of tomorrow. Um, so, you know, that, I guess, is the biggest uh, uh, takeaway is that Rob uh, May, did a wonderful job at bringing in all these incredibly talented people and, and, and all of the disciplines, brought in a great leadership team. They brought in great folks from every you know, great Boston company. Um, and that's what our, our CEO, Vishal, uh, uh, is now doing. I mean, he's a master recruiter, brings in all these wonderful people from all over the place. And I think we've all kind of learned a little bit uh, uh, of that in our, in our own ways. Uh, and we're trying to kind of replicate what we saw uh, uh, as frontline employees uh, here at Linksquares now? Long answer, uh, but, but it, it's, it's hard to summarize the magic of a place like that. That's a tight Boston tech crew right there. Everything you just said. I mean, it's it, the Boston tech community. I used to sell into Boston when I, when I was at G2 and it's, it's, it's amazing how many people have gone uh, Dynatrace, HubSpot, just the rounds to drift. I mean, I feel like all of them, it's, you know, data as well. Yeah, and sometimes it takes a while, right? Uh, Neil Brown, our, our newest director of sales, he's coming over from Datadog. I, I was recruiting him for four years. He was a part of the original Backup of Five crew. Now he's uh, uh, officially with Link Squares. Uh, and there's still a few others out there that, that we've been recruiting for a long time that we want to get back uh, 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 in these four walls to help us. Uh, yeah. But yeah, absolutely. Get the well, band um, back together. Okay. Go ahead, Ryan. Were you gonna I just say getting, no, I just say I love it. Getting the band back together. Coming, you know, you know, it works trusted and love it. Yeah. Let's jump over to like your team at link squares and just kind of your sales hiring philosophy in general. Like, what do you, what do you look for? We're always uh, uh, looking for folks that um, have, uh, uh, you know, a, a grit, a persistence to them, kind of like a focused intensity, a preparedness, we love folks that do a lot of homework uh, uh, before coming in and they're researching above and beyond just what's on the job description. Uh, uh, that's, a, that's an initiative that's really hard to teach later if, if, it's, not, uh, if it's not something that's underlying. Um, obviously, we look for people that are you know, bright, motivated, um, respectful, uh, humble. Um, and... Um, I think that pretty much encapsulates it. Uh, we're not looking for someone that has 10 years of closing experience. If they do, that's, that's great. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, but we're looking for the underpinning um, DNA uh, in the personality of the individual and their ability to learn, uh, which is often reflected by the uh, uh, amount of research that they do and, and how they present it to you that they've done their homework and all of that is uh, kind of a reflection of their ability to consume information um, and pick things up and naturally go do it without having to necessarily be told. And so I don't know if that helps. <laughs> no, it does. Just, just to kind of level set a little bit um, to the extent that you can share. And I think some of this is probably on, on ref view as well. So they could see this, but like, tell us a little bit, like how big is the deal? Like sales cycle length, like, like how come, is it super technical or not? Like give us a little bit of just kind of high level, like what type of seller, like how technical sort of thing. Yeah. 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 So, so uh, uh, for the record to level set outside of, uh, uh, you know, people and staff, and I've sold uh, mid-market sales uh, uh, in, in technology uh, uh, myself. I've also sold uh, more of like the SMB, like five to ten k uh, uh, type of type of deal. Uh, uh, I, I ran a sales team at, at, at a company called Onshape that was focused more on like product-led growth and inbound model, twenty thousand leads a month type of thing. Uh, uh, and now again at Link Squares, uh, 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 we're more of a mid-market with uh, lower enterprise. Uh, 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 customers today. Our average deal size at Link Squares is $40,000. Our average sales cycle is 45 to, to 60 days, um, depending upon whether we're in a, what we call a build quarter or a close quarter. Uh, uh, that's Q1 uh, is a build, uh, Q3 is a build, Q2 is a close, Q4 is a close. Still close a lot of business in, in the build quarters, but uh, what you'll find is that the sales cycle comes down about 45 days in Q1, Q3. It's more like 65 days in Q2, Q4, and those are averages. Uh, we have a lot of velocity deals that maintain deal size, uh, you know, deals that are 
30K plus uh, closing under 30 days. We have um, many deals that, that uh, operate like that on any given month. Uh, we have many customers that are above $100,000 uh, uh, annually. Um, so we do have the enterprise or, or the lower enterprise motion in place uh, uh, at present. Um, and uh, uh, regardless of all of those things, I still am prioritizing the underlying uh, uh, um, personality drive more uh, uh, than I am necessarily the experience. Yeah. So you, you mentioned, yeah. I would say you mentioned grit, focus, yep. intensity, preparedness. Let, let's let's dig just a tiny bit more on the grit side of things. Like, how do you, what do you, you slash your your team and your leaders that are doing more of the day to day interviewing, right? Is is there a formula that you have to uncover what is the grit? Is there some kind of you know interview interview strategy that you have, um, you know that 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 you'll that you'll leverage to to uncover what's that level of grit, so to speak. That was my question. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think that that preparedness for the interview, the tenacity that somebody brings to the quality of their research and the presentation of how bad they want the position uh, 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 based upon the amount of effort that they put in uh, to coming into this interview ready to roll, that says something. Then I think it's all about their life, right? Uh, um, we have more of conversational interviews uh, at Link Squares where we try and get to know the person uh, uh, as well as get to know uh, uh, their hard skills, hard experiences. Uh, both are equally important in my opinion. Uh, and sometimes it's like obvious through the conversation, stories come out about something that they had to overcome. And if we have to tease it out, we will. Uh, uh, if we don't get into a conversation uh, organically with somebody about a moment in their life where they had to overcome adversity, uh, we'll just ask that exact question. Uh, 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 but um, yeah, so so that's how we like to think about it is adversity in someone's life and how they met it uh, and what they learned from it um, oftentimes helps us get a good understanding of, of someone's underlying grit and commitment uh, and work ethic. What's an example of a question that you can think of that you've asked that's dug that out that may not be obvious to a candidate? Can you think of anything? Yeah, I, I will. I, I will either based upon the conversation and the flow of the conversation, I will double click on something and try and, and try and go deeper. I'm trying to stay in an active uh, uh, listening mode whenever I'm in an interview, uh, as every great seller should. Uh, but if I'm not finding the thing to hook on to, I'll just take a step back and I'll ask them the very generic question of, hey, at what point in your life do you feel like you faced uh, uh, the most adversity? Like, what was that story for you? And it's just like, give me something to work with is, is really what I'm looking for. And yeah. oftentimes just asking that question, you will find the most profound uh, uh, stories. Uh, uh, everybody has, uh, 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 you know, a lot of people have that story uh, uh, when you ask them that question. Some people uh, uh, do not, right? They're like, well, I, I don't know. Like I had a hard, uh, hard time passing physics junior year of high school. Yeah. And it's like, well, you, you've been out, like you've been out of college for 10 years. And we're going to talk about that. Like, tell me more about that. Right. And maybe there's something really compelling, but if there isn't and they're not surfacing, a, you know, a strong story there, uh, things become far less compelling. Uh, uh, it's also like a, a, a skill set thing. Right. Like, you know, we're looking for folks that are storytellers. We're looking for folks that can on the fly think on their feet. Right. Um, you know, uh, uh, clarifying questions. Uh, uh, I love when someone asks for a clarifying question on a question like that. So when you say adversity, like what are you meaning by that? And what are you trying to learn here? Right? Like, I'm like, oh, wow, that's a great seller question. Right? I uh, take a loan uh, out on the trust fund that didn't kick in yet. Uh, you know, yeah. I had to my expenses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and there's that, you know, too. But uh, uh, yeah, so, so uh, interviewing can be a lot of fun, uh, um, but it's definitely, uh, uh, you know, the quality of your discovery in an interview uh, uh, is just as uh, important as the quality of discovery uh, in a deal. Whether you're the hiring manager or you're the candidate, uh, 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 that moment uh, uh, is the moment to qualify 
uh, 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 you know, on both ends. And it's always the quality of the questions, right? So Ryan and I talk about this a lot. It's and Ryan posted about this this morning about you know if if a company is going to ask you a question in an interview, you should ask the same question phrased back to them. Like, hey, you know, the hiring managers like show me proof that you've been to Presidents Club. The candidates should say, show me proof that you've hit uh, quota. Your team's hit quota multiple times. You know, it should be yeah. tit for tat and kind of a, a two way yeah. street. And I think a hiring manager you should appreciate something like that if you get that pushback because that's what they should be doing with clients too. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I love questions like that. And I, you know, you called it at the beginning. I believe transparency is the key to attracting the best talent, uh, which is why I bring it to the forefront of LinkedIn posts, which, by the way, are, are a large recruiting effort uh, uh, by me. Right. That's that's my number one focus. Uh, and it's the number one benefit that I get from being active on LinkedIn. We find a ton of candidates that way. Um, half of our team uh, uh, started off uh, uh, inter interacting with me personally in the DMs, right? Uh, which is great. Um, but yeah, so uh, uh, when you're a candidate, you have to interview the heck out of the company, right? That's how a lot of people find themselves in these situations where they are all of a sudden blindsided, right? Uh, uh, and, and it's a learning thing too, right? So if you're listening and you were blindsided, right? It's it's not it's it's not you know shame on you. It's shame on the company. But learn from that experience and, and dig into the the health of the business next time you're interviewing. And uh, the type of leadership you want to work with is going to be excited about answering uh, uh, those questions versus creating a stone wall of uh, information protection. Right. That's not a good forecast of a, of a, of a strong relationship and future. If someone's not willing to tell you things about their business, my opinion, yeah. I wouldn't resonate with it. Right. So, so that's the, that's the mentality that I take to it. Like the account executive, Steve, who's switching out of uh, uh, recruiting uh, and is thinking about getting into tech, right. What would appeal to that person? Right. Uh, um, what would appeal to that, to, to the Steve that was leaving uh, backup of fine and data going to the next gig? Right. What would appeal to that person? You can't forget uh, 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 to, to, you know, stay in the shoes of, of the AE, the BDR, the manager, the director, you know, whatever appealed to you in those times should be the absolute baseline bare minimum that you do for the people that you're going to recruit uh, 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 into those types of roles. Yeah. Uh Love that. The, um, the CRO over at Lattice, uh, HR software company posted about that this week. Like she has a post-it note on her desk saying, what would younger me want in a role, in a leader? And she's like, I want to be that person and I want to create that environment for my team. So I, I love hearing that the second time this week. I want to meet her because, you know, that's the type of leadership that I like to work uh, with and for, yeah. right? Uh, uh, I'll, I'll make the connection. Dini Meta, that's her name. Cool. Yep. Good to her. Dini. The, uh, you know, you hear like uh, the, the call recording softwares that track and they give you the metric, right. And, and on your sales calls and, you know, you make, make the buyer, you know, if you're a seller talking the whole time, right. That's a, that's a red X, I guess, for your, and it's the same thing in interview processes. We always talk about, uh, and, and although it's not the way it's historically structured to be right. As a, as a interview E right. To the extent that you can, drive the process with intellectual curiosity and questions, not only about like, hey, is your team hitting quota, but, but also like just literally trying to dig in level by level by level into the product market fit, into the problem that the product is solving. So like, this is my PSA. I try and get it in all the time, whenever, whatever venue I have, which is like, if you're interviewing, they're interviewing you to understand how well you'll do discovery and you're doing discovery right now. And so That's exactly right. Check your talk time, right. And, and see what you can elicit. If you can elicit more talk time, you're probably winning at that point during the interview. So that's kind of my, my PSA for intellectual curiosity in the interview as well. I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with that more. I couldn't agree with that more. It's like those questions to me are a great sign. You know, it's, it's like, okay, great. They're willing to ask the tough questions to Darren's point right earlier. Um, but they're, they've been thinking about it, right? They're cerebral enough to like, know that these are the questions uh, uh, that you should be asking, right? Uh, uh, um, oftentimes it reflects experience too, right? You can have two, three years of selling experience 
uh, uh, and come into an interview uh, and start asking questions about the ASP and the sales cycle and conversion rates and how many people are hitting quota and and what's the highest earner going to make and da, 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 and they're just kind of going through it. What's the average time to promotion? How many people get promoted? How many people you hire from the outside versus promoting from within? And you're like, blah, 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 blah. and this and you're like, wow, you graduated three years ago, man, wow, right? And then you have somebody else who's got 15 years of experience who's just like feels like a bump on the lock, right? And sometimes. It's, it's flipped, right? 15 years of experience is incredibly valuable. And, and, and that can give you the baseline to ask all those absolutely perfect questions. And then you might be three years out of school. And it's like, yeah, this person really didn't learn much in their last gig, right? So treating, treating every uh, interview individually for what it is, but man, those questions are huge, which is why I prioritize that. I prioritize, prioritize those things so much more than I do just what's on the resume. Well, so here's a shameless rep view plug. There's there's now younger salespeople that have only had a career with rep view. They've they've gotten insight that's never been available before. They they know to ask these questions that other people don't have the muscle memory to think of. Yeah. They have the scar tissue, but like these younger, I mean, these younger reps are getting this kind of insight that they never had before. Yeah, I I, I love it. I love, I love rep view. If I was an account executive, I would be looking at that and, and looking at uh, the places where people are making money, uh, the places, uh, uh, you know, where people are hitting quota. I'd be looking at all of that. Yeah. I, what, to, go ahead, Darren. Go ahead. Uh, I was just to say, I, I'd, I'd love to pivot into the, the topic around the connectivity of the team and, and um you know, how, how you like, are you hybrid now, you know, like, tell us, tell us kind of the, the model that you guys are deploying. And um, from, from what we're hearing so far, it seems like there's some great things happening from a sales environment perspective and leadership perspective, but love to hear what, what you all are doing on the kind of connected office, hybrid in office uh, strategy and, and how yeah. that works. Yeah, so so I have, I have uh, roughly 130 or 140 people in my org now. Um, and it's split across the new business sales team uh, that does all new logo generation. Uh, uh, there's the customer success organization, which is a revenue owning, uh, uh, a number owning organization at Link Squares. They're responsible for all renewals, upsells, and expansion. So those are those are broken out. Then we have, uh, a, as a part of customer success, we have the implementation and support teams. And I also have revenue operations as a function. Uh, which enablement sits within um, and all of these different, and we ha also have the technical solutions attorneys. Okay. This is really cool. The TSAs, uh, 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 the TSAs are like our version of sales engineers, but instead of technical knowledge, we've, we've opted for, for the legal corpus, right? So these are lawyers, attorneys, folks that have, you know, passed the bar, practiced all that good stuff. And they help communicate the value proposition through the product demonstration to our target customers, which is in-house legal teams. Um, all of these different groups work in very different ways and they have a very different profile, very different, uh, 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 you know, task at hand that they're, uh, 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 you know, executing on incredibly well across every department. Everyone's doing a great job. Sales, the new business function today is uh, largely a mid-market function with uh, newer sales reps, typically people that have two to 10 years of experience. And that is five days a week in the office in Boston. And it works really, really well for us. Um, customer success is more hybrid, one to two days uh, 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 in the office. Implementation support, uh, uh, many are fully remote, and that's great. Um, revenue operations, also uh, very much hybrid, uh, a couple of days a week. Uh, TSAs are in five days a week alongside the uh, new business sales team. They also help po post sale, but they're in uh, every day. So. I don't have a, a, a strong opinion about anything. I have a very strong opinion about what works. Uh, 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 I don't care about being right. <laughs> so I'm quick to change my position on things. Uh, but what I've seen in the data, what I've heard from the leadership and the new business sales team is that we're gonna be able to produce higher productivity reps, which is good for the reps. Uh, we're going to be able to decrease ramp time. We're going to be able to increase our conversion rates and ultimately our top line growth, right? Which is what everybody wants, right? If that was true for customer success, uh, they would be in every day, right? 
uh, uh, but it's not, it's not true, right? It's, it's a different role. Uh, 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 so look at everything individually for what it is. Uh, uh, and our sales team uh, is one of the few, which is a huge competitive differentiator to folks that do want to be in office. Uh, they're in five days a week because most companies right now are hybrid or, or even fully remote. So the people that are looking for that in-office experience to learn quickly, to make a ton of money, to come in and, and hit the ground running as fast as possible, can't do it. You can't do it as fast uh, 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 remotely, in my opinion. Uh, you just can't hear that top performer while they're, you know, jiving on the floor. Uh, you can listen to Gong, you can try, but it's just not, in my opinion, as plugged in uh, 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 as that in-office experience. And the data's backed it because we were hybrid, we were fully remote. We've seen the difference in the numbers and uh, uh, it's held well for us. How, how material are those? Uh, so I was going to ask a couple of follow-up questions, right? So yeah, you are you are in the minority in that. It's, that doesn't mean that's good or bad. It just means it's right. what you are. Um, and I think there's, I think it's easy for us to see ramp impacted. Once you're fully ramped, you're saying data shows and kind of what we see, it's better five days. Um, what's, g give us a little bit of color on that. Like, why do you believe for, for you all that the productivity metrics have exceeded the prior, maybe you were hybrid or something. Before yeah, it's just, it's just, it's just comparing numbers and spreadsheets, right? Yeah. Uh, 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 this is more of the science side of the job. So um, for a long time, uh, uh, we were hybrid, uh, 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 even uh, as, as recent as, you know, early 2021. Um, we'd be in a few days, you know, obviously it's touch and go with COVID, everything like that. Um, since re committing to, uh, uh, um, it started small, actually. It started with like a lot of companies I think are going to get there. It's just that they're going to take a little bit longer. Uh, it started hybrid and we saw the production boosts on the days uh, 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 where people were hybrid. We saw the output uh, uh, boost from folks that opted in to more of those in office days versus those that, that took the optional uh, uh, at home more frequently. Um, we, saw, we saw objective differences there. Uh, and then since, uh, uh, and that was encouraging for us to try uh, uh, in office full five days a week. And then we saw those numbers uh, get uh, uh, driven up even higher than before, right? And these are, these are you know, uh, uh, numbers like um, pipeline creation, conversion rates, um, uh, uh, you know, output commissions, all of it, retention of our reps, was uh, uh, you know about sixty six percent when we were uh, remote uh, and hybrid, and now it's north of eighty percent, right? So more our reps are being more our reps are being more successful. They're they're booking more deals. They're making more money. Our quota attainment has gone up as well. Um, you know, it's it's something that is working really well in the mid market. However, in the enterprise. Uh, we have an we have an emerging enterprise practice. We're going to have to uh, uh, approach that just as uniquely as I'm approaching uh, uh, the different functions uh, uh, that I have under management. Uh, uh, that is going to be a different thing, right? Uh, uh, in time, it's going to evolve. And if that is an in office role, great. Likely, we're going to have to you know hire talent that's going to be fully remote. Uh, that are industry experts that have been in the contract lifecycle management space for you know quite some time, and just going to take a take a totally different uh, 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 you know approach that suits that task uh, uh, for what it is. Got it. Do do the uh, do, from a benefits standpoint, uh, is there anything unique or different? Hey, you're coming in the office, but there's this and this. How, how how do you all think about any other you know kind of benefits as it relates to being in the office or like? man, gas is expensive and things like that, or like uh, the office environment is X, Y, Z. Have you, have, you, have you kind of balanced that at all? Or do you even think about that? Just try and create a world-class working environment. It's an awesome office. Uh, um, it's, it's, you know, all the premium stuff that you would expect in a uh, pre-pandemic world, right? We have all of that here. I think I think that the four walls and the furniture and, and uh, the lunches and the cold brew and all of that stuff pales in comparison to the bonds uh, that people are building, the relationships that they're having, 
the psychological impact of being around other people on an ongoing basis and having that laughter and, and, and some of that fun and some of that noise and the ability to go out and grab a bite or having a horrible day and you just got hung up on 10 times in a row and you're about to cry. Uh, 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 you know, you have your friend put their arm around you and, you know, take you downstairs and go for a nice long walk and look at the water in Boston and realize the world's not ending harder to do when you're your out spouse, your, your spouse or your roommates don't want to hear that when that happens. Yeah. 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 It, it, and it, you know, it's a thing, right? Like we're recruiting people that this is what they're, this is what they want. This is a part of their interview process. Like this is what they're looking for. They know what it is. Um, so they're opting into it. Right. And they're finding what it is that they're looking for, which I which I believe is more of that in the learning and and the and the individual hands on FaceTime versus you know maybe at the maybe at their last job uh, uh, the management team did the absolute best job that they that, that that they could by scheduling Zoom meetings a couple you know a few times a week for coaching after you know listening to one or two gong calls, right? Uh, uh, just not cutting it for uh, you know a lot of people. A lot of people want hands-on. They want the full thing. They want, you know, to go full Daniel Day Lewis and learn this job inside and out. Right? Those are the people that were that were prioritizing that we're looking for. Awesome. Yeah. Win, winning, yeah. Cure, winning cures a lot of a lot of uh, problems, a lot of issues, a lot yeah, of true. you know, you know, yeah. not worried about the salespeople aren't as worried about all the benefits. If if winning is happening, they'll they'll put up with quite a bit. Or uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we have a 401k match. Uh, 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 you know, we're paying people well. Uh, I think the best thing that we offer is a quarter, a quarterly accelerator. Uh, baseline account executive quote is 160. Uh, excuse me, it's a uh, 700, it's 675 thousand a year, which is like 167.5 per quarter. The second, and our average deal size is uh, 40K. So it doesn't take a, a lot. Uh, I mean, it takes a lot. It takes a massive amount of effort, focus, skill, it, you know, but if you get those five or six deals in to get over that quota, we pay 26% uh, on the dollar for every deal over that. So you're, yes. so you're on OTE at the 167.5. Second, you go over 26%. Uh, 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 that one individual I mentioned earlier, who's our top biller, he's going to make a hundred grand commission check here in July for, for, for June's, uh, uh, results, right? This is, this is someone that has eight months of sales experience, right? That's life-changing. Uh, uh, yeah. And then yeah. you get to do it again next quarter and you get to do it again in December. It's not an annualized thing. If at any point in time you want to go look for a new job, I'm not going to use the end of year, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, uh anchor, to try and retain my people, right? Every quarter you have the opportunity, no matter how bad your Q1 was, we're not gonna count that against you. Q2 exists in a vacuum, go blow with the accelerator, right? If you don't do it, well, you got Q3 to do it. Yeah, and if you is... did it, you gotta, and you, if you did it, you gotta do it again, right? And, and we're promoting, and, and here's, a great, here's a great feature uh, of our sales team, a great benefit. Um, we have seven sales managers today. Uh, uh, six were promoted from within. Yeah. Right? That's you know, <laughs> uh, uh, we did like 12 promotions uh, 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 last month. That's a, great, that's a great benefit. People care a lot about that stuff uh, uh, more than they care about the coffee and, or like parking. Oh, yeah. or whatever. Let me call that out real quick. We, I actually had a LinkedIn post the other day, uh, earlier this week, where we were highlighting some high paying roles. And there was one in there where the, there was a million dollar type of role, like top earners make a million and the deal size was like 40 something K, right? And somebody was like, well, the math doesn't work. That's impossible. I said, no, the math, the math does work. And here's how the math works. Yeah. Like yeah, if you have yeah, 40 K. You have to like, walk me through it. If the math works, the math works. But like yeah. oftentimes, you know, I'll talk to a rep, right? We have no negotiation. We publish all of our salaries. If you're an AE at 75, 75, a 150 plan, uh, uh, it's a hittable quota. If you're 85, 85, it's 170 OTE. If you're a team lead, it's 95, 95, it's 190. Uh, uh, this, is, this, is how, this is how we pay people. And then 26% accelerator is where you make a lot of your money. Yeah. So there's one individual that I was talking to. He was like, yeah, but I'm a, I'm a 100, 100 type of person. And it's like, yeah, it's great. That's awesome. I would rather be on a 75, 75 making 300 than a 100, 100 making 140. 
right? <laughs> you know, it's like at the end of the day, like you got to you got to push into the details. You got to talk about you know what are top reps actually making, right? Uh, uh, what are bottom reps making? How long is the ramp time till I'm going to even make money? Right. Like all of that stuff is so, so important. And that's what I love about rep view is, you know, it's honest, it's straightforward. Right. Yeah. Um, it's great it's, accelerators. Yeah, yeah. That's how you get to super high numbers is when you're doing really well, your loaded commission rate across that annual period or a quarterly period is 20, 18%, 20%, 21%. Yeah. Yeah. That's where the magic is. Right. But how many people right. are actually doing it? Right. That's and, the question. And, and, and in my seg and in that segment, the segment that I'm interviewing for, that's what they need to know. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. My team, my manager that I'm going to, I'm going to be aligned with how many people, how many people hit uh, 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 under this person? Yep. Oh, but the Why team crushed it. Oh, Maybe. that manager crushed his number. No, I care about how many people, because that's, that's how I'm going to yeah. make money. I don't care how the manager's making money. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we're, we're cutting close on time. Uh, I guess on the last last side of things, uh, we asked this to everybody. Would you show, I mean, I, I think I kind of know the answer, but would you show a sales candidate your CRM or your quota attainment dashboard? Absolutely. You talk about it on LinkedIn. I figured you probably would. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think that there's, there's so much nuance uh, to all of it that I like to explain the nuance, right? Like, okay, when you build a hiring plan as a CRO, you're planning for attrition whether you like it or not, right? So, so uh, we have 80% retention right now, which is really good in my opinion, from what I've seen. Um, so that means eight to 10 reps that we hire are gonna succeed, okay? What does success look like relative to quota, right? How long is it gonna take to get there, okay? Um, how many people have you hired in what window of time? How many are considered to be fully ramped? How many are considered to be ramping? Right? That's going to affect your ratio, right? So, okay, you hire 20 people and they're in the first two months uh, on the gig, but it's a six month ramp. They're going to take down your uh, uh, quota attainment, so to speak, as an average of all. But if you isolate to the 20 that have been there for over six months, that survived, right? That, that are in that 80%, not the 20% where it didn't work out despite best intentions and efforts by both parties, right? Of that 80% that's post six months, who's hitting quota? How many are hitting quota? What are they making? What's the top, what's the top biller making? How long was the top biller uh, on the job before they started making this money? What did month one, one, two, three, four, five, six look like for their personal finances? I would, I would show all of it in personal finance, meaning like how, what was their commission from the company to them? I'd show all of it. Why not? Why not? Why right? not? That's it's the like, thing. It's, why it's, not? It's, it's, cr it's crazy to me because as an account executive, as, as an account executive, I'm not going to get totally uh, uh, turned off by a company if their, if their quota attainment is 50% and 80% of their reps have been there for a year or less, but they're, the 50% that are hitting quota are crushing quota and they're making a ton of money, right? I'm betting on myself to be one of those 50% that are making the ton of money. And I'm also a realist that realizes that the people that are in this uh, uh, first year, on average, the B player, you know, is gonna take a little bit longer to get there, right? So I'm optimizing my world for A players, like, cause I was an A player, right? And I want to find people that are like, yeah, I, don't, I want that. I want the 26% accelerator. I want to, you know, go from the lobster boat to 100K paycheck, right? <laughs> that's, that's pretty compelling, right? American because Dream's alive. Real. American yeah. Dream's alive. It's out there. You just got to find it. Yeah. Yep. Thanks for coming right. on, Steve. I appreciate you guys. I love what you're yeah. doing. Appreciate yeah. it. Thanks for coming yeah, on. We appreciate you. Great conversation. Yeah. Thank you, Ryan. Yep. Good luck with everything, guys. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. thanks.